Dante, and I think Jeff, that comes from you, probably. Yes. Frank, I, just, I have um, three little requests from the community. Can we add them to the agenda? I'm sorry. Them? Sorry, they just came in yesterday. So yep. they I'm sorry, I should have done that. Yeah. Can you tell me what they are? Oh, um, assured loading for uh, people with um, TAT forms, transport assistance. Assured loading? Assured loading for people with medical TAT forms, the paint okay. slips. Um, um, that is the one. Oh, and um, shoveling um, with a, not mandatory shoveling, but a criteria for shoveling so people know if people can do the trip. Okay, uh, shuffling. So the shoveling sign has been installed. It's up on the lamp standard at the top of the mirror. It's a rectangular box sign. You see it. We tested it in the yard and we tested the controls and we're able to get the messages up. Um, there's an IT link that they're still working on in order to get that messaging from the ship to the sign. Uh, but we fully expect that to be resolved in the next week or so. And, and by the time we're up and running, Cable Ferry will have the requested shuttling sign. Yeah. <laughs> so, are there two signs? No, it's, it's at the dim and west side. Right. Is it the fact that they made that information from the right. 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 I thought you said there was one, like one location. Not to turn on, not to but no, one. there's one sign. It's on the land standard, um, right hand side as you're approaching the new ramp. Oh. And you'll see it's a, right now it's black, but it's a LED sign. Right. It's the one that's covered up right now. Uh, yes. Yeah. You mentioned the, 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 the uh, people at the booth on uh, Bank Around know when the ship was shuttling. I've come to it before, but I'm not sure. And the captain had told the the booth and so I right in. Yeah. And, and I'll accept that, that maybe they didn't have the right information, but typically the shuttle decision isn't always made at the time you arrive at the booth. It could be made as well. And what we ask them to do is make a, a PA announcement to the terminal. So that may be something we need to reinforce to make sure the updated information is coming out. They seem to do that most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. All the time. Okay. And that is the pro procedure, but if it needs a little tweak, that's happy to do that. Any other comments? But yeah. Jeff, seeing that we're on the shuffling side, do you want to just put a little the shuttling criteria, slip it in there too while we're on the subject or what? Um, we could do if that's okay with everybody. Yeah. Okay with that? Sure, go ahead. No, we just, if I, just that we were talking about it, like the, the decision, not that I'm being critical here, but you know, when the decision's made or whatever, like, um, yeah, what is the criteria? Or, I, I think we've spoken about this before and it, and it, and it, it depends. It, it does. It's really, um, people would look at it, if you looked at it normally, you would, you would think it was inconsistent, but really what it all depends on is what sailing it is, because there are times when we'll shuttle, um, when we're talking Route 21, we'll shuttle when it doesn't appear to have much traffic at all, and it'll shuttle because Route 22 is shuttling, and so we're waiting for like nine cars, we're trying to allow the Oregon residents to make the connection. Okay. Typically, the, the criteria what we use is, is when the ship comes in and we're talking usually during the breaks, unless somebody calls and says the traffic is lined up way up here, right? And it's over basically a one and a half sailing weight. But typically, what happens is the master comes in and when he looks up the hill, if he sees up the hill, and you're basically three quarters up the hill, which is 25, 30 cars, and 25 cars, right? Because you have two lanes in the top of the hill, then you'll trigger shopping. Okay, and then the protocol is that once once the Peninsula or will be the cable ferry decides to shop, they they call the colloquium on the radio to let them know because obviously the schedule goes out the window. So they 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 coordinate for that. With the current schedule, I uh, this example on September eighth, which is the day after the launch. Yeah. I uh, the ferry was shuttling. <coughs> Remember that shuttling all day long, all day long. Yeah. And I arrived at the terminal at 5:30, 5:35, and uh, it was leaving because it was shuttling. And I sat there until 8:05, 5:35, 8:05, the next ferry. And there were 15 cars with me. 
got the car waiting and, and they found them stripping. They didn't get home with that car. And, and that's part of the problem is once, when you, it's not the decision doesn't seem to bother people when we start the shuttling, it's when we end the shuttling because at a certain point, I mean obviously for us, it's, we, we want to keep the vessel on time. And for us to end the shuttling at some point when there's no traffic, we have to stop the ship to get it back on schedule. That's the critical part. That's where you would have fallen into. The master would have arrived, and, and usually what ends up happening is he's on the opposite end of the schedule. So at, at a certain point, the ship has to stop sometime to get it back on time. And that's the critical part with it, right? And it, it's almost better if you say you just keep shoveling the whole night, but obviously that's just not feasible. You're not going to shovel for one or two cards. And, and you got caught in that. That's that's what that Actually, was. I think somebody warned me to turn around and yeah. read camper and boat look like they're going and soon they're going to run you get a new turn on the left. And be clear that typically when somebody arrives at the booth, especially in the Buckley Bay side, and they are going to Hornby, if we can accommodate to make allow them to make the connection, we do trigger the shuttle. Okay. And then we can you know, I think uh, well Mark will maybe speak to that but what we're doing is we're gonna try and put this in some sort of a written format so that people will be able to see really what the criteria are. I, I just caution everybody that once you've fixed your criteria, the flexibility gets removed and, and then you may find it actually works less advantageous to the community than the way it is right now. I'd, uh, I'd just like to mention, I think the idea of having criteria is good so that there's understanding all around. But at the same time, maybe what's needed is not so much uh, criteria as guidelines so that there is some flexibility, yeah. but that people can still see the principles that a captain would apply to making that decision. And uh, I know that um, just in my experience over the last few months, and I'm not that frequent a traveler, I go into town maybe uh, once every, somewhere between once a week and every two weeks. My experience has been that the shuttling on the Kronitsa seems to work smoothly, but on the Hornby side, I would say it doesn't. Not from my experience. And one of the more dramatic examples is uh, I was there the Thursday before the Thanksgiving weekend. I was the fifth car on the Kronitsa coming across from Buckley Bay to them in the fifth car. And uh, I got to um, Bradley Bay and I couldn't get on the ferry. He was sailing and uh, I was there. And I had to wait for the, the subsequent sailing. Now, I could understand him not shuttling for myself because it was really only myself in front of the car and you can't shuttle for two cars. But there was a huge backlog of cars for that sailing. And I know the captain hadn't shuttled. The Quidditch was shuttling that day because there was lots of traffic. The cloaky wasn't. So he had a backlog of over 20 cars from the prior sailing, and yet didn't shuffle between those two sailings. And that's what eventually ended up causing myself and being the, even being the fifth car on the Quinets over here, not being able to get on my connecting sail. And uh, to be fair to the captain, because uh, I was thinking, well, geez, this guy's going to get overloaded and have to do uh, an overtime run now because the Quinets is still shuffling on this side. But to be fair to him, he didn't have to. He just managed to squeeze everybody on on the last sailing of the day going to Harmon. Yeah. So from his standpoint, that was a very efficient thing to do. But he did have, he did keep about 20 people waiting on the Hornby side before I got there without shuffling. And uh, and then I wasn't able to get on. But again, that's neither here nor there because there was only two of us at that point. But I'm thinking to myself, you know, he's held up 20 people roughly for approximately, I don't know, anywhere from an hour to maybe half an hour, depending on when they shuttle from over here. And he's doing that to save 24 bucks in round trip gas because the crew is already being paid. You know? And I just, I'm not sure what the best answer is to this, but I'd like that to be a consideration, the amount of time that our people are being held up by not shuttling when the cost is so low for him to make a shuttle. You can look at that and you're right. Typically, typically it's going the other way because typically when people are home, 
Well, our, the criteria is, are we going to get everybody home by the end of the night? Right. Right? And, and so if at the end of the night, you know you're going to carry everybody, we do that. You know, I mean, I think we apply the same basic rules that we would apply even for the major to, in that can't just start, if we start the shuttling process, then you might as well say we're just shuttling all the time, and that's it. And, and so I, I like the idea of the guidelines, we'll work on it, okay, we'll put something together soon. And uh, Mark, you've got a rough draft anyways, right? Yeah, we're, we're, you know, it's an effort to improve the clarity of our decision making between ferries and our, and our customers, you know. Um, but as Al says, we have to be careful to not rigid. In fact, nothing we come up with in, gui in, in guidelines is, the, is a good term. Um, nothing we come up with will be intended to reduce the uh, discretion of the Marine Superintendent and the Captain to make the decision. So there will always be local factors that they will come in. Uh, but at the same time, we want to put down the guidelines so the customers can say, okay, broadly speaking, what's the, what, what are the corporate parameters within which the Captain and the Marine Superintendent and another the regional managers are operating. Even if it's just framed as uh, things to consider in making this yeah. decision. Yeah. Yeah. So, one thing the communities need to be alive to is sometimes shuttling doesn't actually get you that much more capacity. It might feel like it, but at the end of the day, if you only have an extra, you know, half a round trip, okay, and, you know, uh, that doesn't sound sensible, but you might only get an extra half round trip, although it's, it becomes a full round trip when you go into the overtime to, to get home at night. But that might be empty. So the effective capacity increase might only be half a month. And yet you've been off schedule all day. And you need to weigh the cost benefit here. Our preference corporately is to stick to the schedule because it's known, it's agreed, and people can plan for that. Um, but there is a perception that shuttling um, is, is a vast increase in, in, in capacity on the route. When if you look at the number of round trips completed in a day, that may not actually uh, be the case. It's a particular consideration for us after the midday gap because that's when we get that one. Yeah, yeah, and you want to you, can, you want to see it moving. Yeah. And, and actually, the, the reality of the shuttling between Hornby and Denman, and I think between Denman and Buckley Bay, so I'm not so much an authority on that, is that you could do a shuttle right in the middle and stay on schedule. Close. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Very yeah. Close. yeah. But we have to bear in mind the reality is that. We are managing to do X number of trips by the year. Just that fine line that we've just gone through with service level adjustments, right? I think, because I got up to the summary here, we did 137, on Route 21, we did 137 shuttle trips, extra trips. And on Route 22, 200 trips this summer extra to accommodate the year. But again, that was because the, the requirement was there. People I know on Hornby, people were backed up. Okay. Way, way up there. Yeah, yeah. And, and is it fair to say that in the summer you're making money on those trips? Because there's a lot of the, those, tri those trips tend to be full ferries, correct? Well, it, it, to be realistic, if at the end of the day if we had to change the schedule and at the end of the day we carried everybody, we're making exactly the same amount of money. We've actually lost money because no hurt fuel. Even though it's $24, we've lost $24 every extra trip that we've done. Plus the penalty meal, right? That's the other thing you have to take into account is that it triggers overtime penalties once you start shopping. That's just, that's cut and dry to us, and that's an operational cost. So at the end of the day, you're right, if at the end of the day we look at the master looks at and goes, we're not going to get everybody to Hornby, we have to shuttle, then yes, you're right. But otherwise, to, to your point, at the end of the day, everybody gets, the, the, you make the call and you squeeze the last car on and you get home, everybody gets home. If you, if you shuttle in the middle of the day to relieve some pressure and the, and the later sailings are empty, you probably carry no no extra traffic. You just need it. You just provide convenience. And so we, we did more round trips for no increased traffic. That's actually a money losing proposition. For the but you've served your clients. So yeah. 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 Oh, there's a couple yeah. there. Okay, so that's, that's the balance that we have to do here. Is the, so remember, we are a contractor. I know you're contracted by that right. schedule, right? So it's a question of do we, uh, customer convenience versus uh, the contract, contracted service that we are contracted to provide. And the, the reality is on 2122, we routinely shuttle because we recognize the benefit on this route and it, and it works well on these two routes. Uh, do we shuttle on any other routes, Alan? No. 
23. Uh, 23, the, the odd time if we do it. I mean, the reality we do it here is for the safety as well, right? Is when cars start getting backed up. We all know people are walking around, these cars going up and down the hill. The same in Buckley Bay, there's only just a limited place to put vehicles, and when they start getting up behind it, it puts people at risk, it puts y'all at risk. And so the decision is very easy for us to say, we're going to carry you because we don't want anything to happen. So once the new ferry terminal is fully operational, and we won't very often be seeing people go up the hill, um, is that going to influence decisions about shuttling? Will we see maybe less shuttling because there isn't that argument to be made about safety? No, because I think what you're going to see is we're going to modify our guidelines. We're going to look at it. I mean, obviously, once it gets operational, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at it and saying, how does it best work? Right? And, you know, I would say that probably at a certain point, we're going to be involved with you guys to say, okay, this is what we're looking at as guidelines. Are you guys okay with this? So you can message it to the community so everybody understands exactly what to expect. I mean, Sorry, I think the guidelines were a particularly good idea because right now, and again, this is a very hard one for us to match here with, uh, with full factual background because we don't know what's happened on our sailings necessarily. We don't know what the captain's thinking is in making decisions. But right now, for me as a traveler, it feels like the shuffling process runs pretty smoothly between here and Buckley Bay, but not so between here and uh, Martin. That's the feeling, and I know that's the feeling of the people in the community who approach us. That's vague, I know, but I think the guidelines might help to address that bit. Yeah. It, these two routes, the Route 23 and the Route 2 Quarter, they're unique. I mean, they're obviously short routes. They lend themselves to a shuttling operation. I mean, our preference is we have schedules on all those routes that will carry the traffic. But, <laughs> Um, when you get those peak periods, we have peak periods on all the other routes where we don't show and we do get sailing things. These routes, they happen to be short, so it lends itself to the events. We've always done And you see, short part of the issue is purely the schedule reductions because we're acknowledging that during it, that the current schedule acknowledges that there's an extremely busy time of year, or an incredibly busy time of year. But then it goes from 60 to zero, kind of, you know, all of a sudden at one point. And although that coincides with the vacation time for school students, it doesn't necessarily coincide with the traffic uh, uh, access in the islands. Uh, because there's lots of people who come here in what we term our shorter season, which is a very important period for us. And I think that's what feels to me like the bigger issue. And maybe in your guidelines, uh, that could be something built in as well. The, the, the shoulder period uh, for our islands, which is typically beginning of May to end of June, beginning of September to end of October, maybe the guidelines could be a little different for that period, acknowledging that there is increased traffic during the time. Yeah, uh, just, you know, the, if, if you look at the map, the moving people and, and your very size, so. Well, what's you know we have those ferries that capability and the size for um, some I don't know what but they currently in the winter they're they're oversized and in the summer they're undersized <coughs> generally and, and so in summer you have to shuttle and, and I, I guess you know our, the BC ferries mandate is is it to stick to the schedule or to move people it's a um, it, it's always important to remember uh, BC Ferries role in this is a contractor to provide the service which is in our in the contract given to us by the government and they've contracted us to provide the schedule every time we sail uh, uh, every time we shuttle we're actually going beyond our contractual obligations with no guarantee that we make any money doing it in fact we go beyond the schedule we could well be losing money and this is most definitely the case that we will lose money when we shuttle Sometimes we might make money. If the, if the ship is jammed all day right to the very last sailing and we've shuttled all day, we've probably made a little. Um, but if that ship is not full on every sailing and we're shuttling, we're losing money. And we are, we are going above contract for one reason only, and that is customer service. We're not mandated to go above contract at all. We're not mandated to shuttle. So it's a customer service initiative on our part. Um, and we do what we can with the assets and the people that, that we have. In March, right? Sorry. No, I, I just said, the, when we come off shuttling, though, as Jack raised, it, it, it's a concern. When we come off shuttle, 
in an effort then to essentially stem our losses. And uh, when we do that, we end up making customers potentially unhappy. So the decision to go into shuttling is one we don't want to take lightly because we could end up, instead of creating goodwill on the part of the customers that, oh, look how convenient it was, we might end up in a situation that Jack found himself in where actually we're eroding the goodwill uh, rather than creating it. So it's, it's, it's a complex decision for the, uh, for the, you know, the Marine Superintendent and the, uh, and the Captain. I, I'd, the like, I'd, I'd like to point out something that will then just to shift the mood in your thinking, perhaps, of BC Ferries. If you keep referring to the government contract, you have to remember where a big chunk of your income is coming from. And that's not the contract with the government, that's the fees we pay to use the service. It's 80 bucks to get to Harvey. Okay, and we pay this on a regular basis as your clientele. So I, I'm sorry, the, the, the line that you are just a contractor of the government constrained by this, where it's very thin with me when I know the kind of contribution that we're making to your business each year. That's not lost. It's not, it's not um, our, our service fees we receive from the province for these rooms are very prescriptive. We're serving on round trips each day. And uh, if we go under those round trips, we're actually penalized. If we go over those round trips like markets, we don't receive any further service fees. So um, these routes, I mean, they're obviously heavily subsidized. So. Well, I take Mark's comment to be accurate that they lose money, but I thought I heard the loss of money was $24. Yeah. That's between them and then Harvey. That's the, that's the cost of the fuel for a round trip, because they already have to pay this. <clears throat> well, if it's, is it substantially more than that? Sorry? Is the financial loss substantially? I mean, I don't know why the $24 was thrown out there. Then we're going to have a we're going to have a cable ferry on this side. I don't think our fuel uh, costs are going to be exorbitant. So I I, I can I uh, can see that there's a financial loss, but size counts. How much of a loss? Right? Is it is it small? Convenience is what it's all about. We need, we need that we need that, um, that well. We can all we, we know what living on taking a ferry means, right? You'll be taking good novel with you. But uh, if it means waiting for an hour and a half or something, or you know, it's really gonna change me. So I, I accept the uh, that there's a financial loss, but I think it's not that great. So I mean it, it's a difficult call. I mean you've got a vessel that will serve the route over the course of the day and carry the traffic. And you can't provide a vessel that's going to carry all the traffic in a quarter of that day, no. right? So ideally spread the traffic over the course of the day, we'll carry that traffic over the course of the day. And a guideline will say, we don't shuttle for one car, right? Something yeah, like that. I don't know, I'm, I'm back to the owl's point there. I think the shuttling really is an attempt to get beyond the rigidity of the schedule and provide some flexibility. You need to be quite careful. If you want to introduce criteria, then that flexibility goes somewhat out of the window. But, but you accept the guideline. Yeah. yeah. Um, the question about how, how much it costs would, I, would be interesting to get an answer to. I mean, it's something that we hear a lot and then people, you know, you're sitting there waiting and you say, well, why don't they shuttle? All it costs is fuel. And uh, that would be good information to get out to this It's a good question, but it's also a bit of a slippery slope because, I mean, obviously, incremental cost seems to be just fuel, right? The labor's there. That's a given. That's on a lot of our routes. But then you go beyond when you look at the repair names, the wear and tear on the vessel. Um, there's administration involved, back at the back office, etc. There's hidden costs you don't see. They may not be substantial, but they do add up. And if you added them up across all the routes and said, well, that vessel's there anyways, it's crude, you're paying them, it's just fuel, why don't you run? If you start taking that concept across the entire system, Costs will start to increase. But, but you, you just said you just said that you only have about three runs that lend themselves to sh to shuttle. So that that horn B then then these other runs. So looking at a systemic uh, cost structure.
structure is not really applicable when we're just talking perhaps about two or three runs where that principle may apply in terms of cost savings, correct? Right? Because um, you're not going to start shuttling, you know, on every hour on your big runs or on some of the other. You said that earlier yourself, right? That it was just two or three that lend themselves to shuttling. Because they are small. Correct. So, so perhaps our question is in relation to those particular runs, you know, and I realize we're both trying to achieve the same goal, which is to balance the customer service with the cost of doing that. And I'll get into that a little bit later. I think we have a prepared statement. But I would just say, you know, don't think of it as a system perspective if you're saying it's really just two or three lines that, that you need to really think through that shuttling policy. So I think some of the other groups would definitely get from that because, you know, they end up with waiting times and there's a fixed schedule. We don't shuttle on those routes. And they do have very peak times, just like these three routes. Well. I, I was just using a comment from earlier yeah. when you said really that there's two or three runs that lend themselves well to shuttling and we are one of them. But I think at the end of the day, the common lawyer is just to create something that people can understand. Right? Yeah. They buy money. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I think at the end of the day, that's what we want, right? So we can balance, because at a certain point, customer service to a bunch of people may be that ship sailing on time, which is the scheduled sailing. And, and when they show up for their scheduled sailing and the ship's not there, those people sometimes get very upset. So it's the balance, and I think that's what we look for, is if, we, if you give us the opportunity to put the guidelines together, and we'll run it through you guys, and we'll just see, okay, where are we at? How does it work? We'll try it to make sure that I mean, obviously, it's going to be a living document because people are going to come up with stuff. We'll just we'll fine tune it until we get something that people can look at and understand. Which I think is really what we're looking for. Yeah. Let's just make sure, and you know, I, I think that sounds reasonable. Let's just make sure that this concept of providing service is also a major factor in this as well, because yeah. that's how we see it. So yeah. there's always going to be some tension between how BC Ferries sees this process and how customers see it, because for us, the ferries. And there's no getting around this, it just is. It's essential public transportation infrastructure. Whether or not the province wants to accept that doesn't make any difference. That's what it is for us on the islands. And uh, as such, we have to have a service schedule that works. We just have to. Give us a crack at it. How's that? Yeah. Can I, I just want to go back to Laura's comment. I, I know it's hard to get costs. For us, but as an FAC member, sometimes I feel like I'm sort of hung up to dry because of, oh, come on, it only costs the fuel. And I have nothing to come back with. I can say, oh, there's hidden costs, and they just roll their eyes. So when we ask for costs, we really need them. It's not to be picky or it's so we can give facts back to our community because that's our role. And without those, it makes it really hard. Really hard. And, and this is just another example of if we can't explain your position clearly with facts to support it, we're, we're just sort of up there on the wall. So I really, really encourage you to give us the cost that we ask for. Somebody must have to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and it can come with a caveat. Um, and yeah, we can, sure. we can uh, purvey that to yeah. pay that to people who ask us. But um, I know exactly, that's what I was getting at, is yeah. that feeling of yeah. like, yeah. I don't know what to say now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're right. It's only $24. Don't know what. <laughs> yeah, I don't know yet. I don't know where 20 No one knows where 24 <laughs> came from. <laughs> well entrenched. I don't think you can get a colloquial over and back for 24 bucks a diesel, but uh, we'll probably, we can look into it. <laughs> 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 it's $15.95. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, uh, we have a, a, a history on, on these two routes of, of vastly exceeding our contract. You are already receiving a high level of service, and I realize that doesn't satisfy everybody all the time. But uh, there's only, put it another way, there's only one other route in the system that gets this kind of consideration. So you're, you're already at the top end of the kind of customer service that, uh, that, that BC Ferries customers in general around the network are receiving. But is it not also the case that it's also the most profitable route in the, in the uh, system? It's profitable from a, you know, per sale and per capita basis? This one? No, the route 22. Mm -hmm. uh, probably 21 as well. No, none of these routes are Pardon? profitable. No, none of these routes are profitable no, if you remove the government. No, I understand that, but I'm saying the most cost effective? No, I think that 
depends on it. It, it gets quite complicated in terms of what year you're dealing with. Um, are you just considering labor costs, fuel costs? Then you extend it to repair and maintenance costs. What's happened on the run that year? Has the vessel been taken out for you know periodic repair and maintenance? It only happens once every four years. Or? Well, I guess we're thinking probably scientific. I mean, maybe this is naive, but I'm thinking fuel and labor costs because maintenance, uh, operating costs, those apply to all ferries and all routes. That's kind of a common denominator. They do. You have to understand, uh, like for instance, on the on the Denman Bromley route. The capital infrastructure that went in on either side was probably in order of $18 million, right? So you can't just consider the labor and the fuel costs. It's, it's all costs as well. If you start, if you start putting that, that $18 million price tag on there, that's what gets spread across the system. But again, there were lots of docks renovated as well for the standard I, ice. So I, of course, I wandered around for a little bit. I was just going to ask, so are we providing our expectations that we're going to provide that? And some guidelines? Well, the guidelines for sure. Yes. And then without we're into the cost thing, are we providing yeah. costs? I'd like to know that. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think we're committing uh, to providing that, uh, but what uh, I'm willing to go away and, and, and look at the economics and see if we can provide you with information that enables you to explain it to the residents. What, what is yeah. available publicly is on the commissioner's web website. They are route statements on a route by route basis. It's at a high level. It says what the, the tariffs were on the route for a year, and it says what the overall expenses were and the overall capital costs were. That's publicly available at a high level. You can go look at the tariff your route. We, we looked at that, and we know where it lag from that perspective. But as you say, it may not include capital costs and other things. But when we compare it to the runs, it, it was a positive balance in those things for sure. And you know, other runs may have just had significant upgrades on the terminal. They might have had a new vessel introduced or a new va a vessel uh, upgraded. So it's it's a it's a challenge. But a separate you know, right operating versus capital costs, those two are separate. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Can I just uh, do you keep a track of the operating cost per hour of each run? No, 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 no. no, no. It's, uh, it, it's challenging to do that. Yeah. Well, you got depreciation, you figured in that the terminal's good for 30 or 40 years, but you depreciate the yeah. You have to depreciate over the life of the terminal or over the... We put it on the type of asset, and we depreciate over the, you know, the hull would be 40 years, and the terminal would be 40 years, other components would be 10 years. It's really just all over. I'd like to move on. Yeah, I'll just, I just want to go back to your comment about that our, our routes are, we get one of the best levels of service. And maybe from your perspective, that's how it looks. But mm -hmm. from ours, I've lived on the island about 30 years, and all I've seen is a deterioration of service mm -hmm. and an increase in cost. So, in terms of public relations, that statement wouldn't sit very well. I yeah. don't think it would be more committed. I, I get it. I, I, I get it. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's not maybe a popular way to put it, but uh, as a contractor, we're going well beyond contract here. Where most routes in our network, we don't go beyond contract at all. And it's a relative thing. Uh, it may not meet the public uh, you know, desire, but in terms of the reality of what we physically provide, uh, you, you get a lot of extra service on these routes that other routes do not enjoy. I think part of the reason that they're shuttling is because the capacity of the boats isn't there for the summer. So it's not like we're getting extra service. You're shuttling to meet the requirements of, of the passengers that you need to transport. So I think that's a piece of it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting again, not a popular perception, but we, um, our, our uh, contract says we have to meet an annual capacity target. Peaks don't come into it. So again, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but we have a contractor, uh, and it's a business that we have to run in order to be sustainable, to be around for the long term. And it says we have to carry the, the previous year's traffic. And um, we do that easily with the, with the ships on this route, and the, annual, the average annual capacity utilization on these routes is probably from 40%, 50%. So we, by, by these measures, by the measures that we're contracted to provide, we are easily meeting our requirements. Uh, I'll admit we've got a huge summer peak, but our contract is silent on meeting peaks. 
contract is to provide the annual capacity. And again, uh, not, not to be argumentative, we don't, we don't set these terms in the contract. This is something that's negotiated with the government. Who, and um, if, if those terms, if you wanted to have a term relating to peak capacity in there, then that is a policy decision that would have to be debated with government. We simply do not have the power or the, the position to unilaterally make any changes there. In re, in, given the rigidity of that, we have opted on a local level to try and meet the customer's expectations in the peak by enhancing service by adding in these 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 uh, these uh, shuttle round trips. So that's kind of the view from our chair. Uh, just trying to put it that way. I don't know. Um, if you're saying that your contract doesn't deal with peak versus non-peak season, then why are there peak versus non-peak schedules on I think most, maybe all routes? That's just a choice the, that you make, but you don't that, have to do. We set the schedules, but we but the capacity is set by the contract. And does the contract set anywhere for any group? Does it the contract mention peak versus off peak season? I, no, it's no. just you must okay. carry the previous year's traffic. I believe. Yeah, that's over over, 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 over for the yeah. over the whole year. Yeah, so if it all happened on one weekend, you could just rest all the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's hmm. there's minimum. Round trips per day. And then there's round trips per day, and there's an operating day. Okay. It's all in the contract. We find our peak season schedules typically exceed the minimum of round trips per day. Uh, and the round trips will be identified by season. That's identified by the contract as well. Peak mm -hmm. Is it something that BC Ferries might be prepared to move forward or suggest to the government that they look at this idea of peak season when common sense and reality makes it very clear that it's always going to be there? Uh, it, we could, uh, you know, every three years the contract is renegotiated uh, substantially on the basis that the, of the previous performance term. But you know, there is the opportunity for both parties to come to the table with suggestions. I mean, it's a table, it's a suggestion we can bring forward. The PT four contract, of course, is just done, so it's yeah. kind of four years away now. But um, but you need to be very kind of careful what we wish for here. Uh, and think about what it might do to fares. If you wanted to have enough capacity in stall on these routes to deal with the peak, uh, you could be talking tens of millions of dollars of infrastructure, which will be funded from the fare box. Unless you can talk the government into a greater service fee, which uh, hasn't happened yet. Yes. Uh, so it's a, it's a, but the simple, the simple approach to peaks is shuffling. Exactly, and that's why we do it. But this That's why we do that. a change between off peak and peak, and then it's augmented then by a shuttle, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. To take a Ford, to, I mean, again, we're the service provider, we don't always want to come back to that, but in terms of taking for a proposition to the province, um, you know, we just went through the round of service level adjustments. The intent there was to work within that, that box. If, if you added more to the peak, then typically they would say you would need to take from the off peak and basically end up with the same number of round trips over the year. So it's not a net net. What, what David's saying is that having just gone through several of the service level adjustments, we know the appetite of our government to add capacity is probably zero. Mm -hmm. you know, but you can, but you we can, can put it on the table, but it's... But I guess what I'm thinking is that the government is definitely going to get this message from the users. And it, it would only help if it could also come from the service mm -hmm. provider. Simply, and you, because nobody can argue there isn't a peak in season. Anybody with more than seven healthy brain cells knows that the, mm -hmm. the use and the pet capacity in the summer is extraordinarily higher for these islands than it is in the off season. So it kind of, and also because the service reductions were were done with uh done and then. We, we see the fallout and deal with it. I don't think anybody could make an argument, even in government, that, that, they, that they were bound to get it right the first time. So I'm just trying to look for corners and edges where it might be possible to make arguments for additional service fees from the government based on simple reality. I don't know, mm -hmm. just something mm -hmm. that maybe if you could consider for the next round of negotiations, it would be. Sure. I don't see how it would be hard to make a case for it, whether or not they would accept it. Is really mad. It's very hard to make a case for it. That's very hard. That's uh, moving around in a number of areas, but uh, interesting discussion.